Welcome again to Grand Rounds. It's um, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Skip Pope. Many of you know him already. For those of you who don't, he is the director of the Biological Psychiatry Laboratory here at McLean Hospital and a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Um, he's the author of more than 300 peer-reviewed papers on a wide range of topics in the field of psychiatry. In 2003, he was named by the Institute for Scientific Information as one of the most widely cited psychiatrists in the world, and also as one of the most widely cited neuroscientists in the world. For more than 30 years, he has taken a special interest in substance use disorders, and especially the use of anabolic steroids and other performance enhancing drugs. Today, he's going to talk about the randomized response technique and the unmasking of doping in uh, the field of um, international sports. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Pope. Thank you. So today I'm going to tell you about a study we, we recently published that sent shockwaves through the international athletic community. But before I tell you about the study itself, I need to give you about 15 minutes worth of background on methodology here about the so-called randomized response technique, which is really quite a fascinating technique unto itself. In the mental health business, we spent a lot of time asking people uncomfortable questions, uh, embarrassing questions, questions where they may not want to tell the actual answer in a public setting. Um, and these delicate questions get particularly delicate if you're somebody like me who's in the substance abuse business, because people with substance abuse issues may be particularly reluctant to give you a truthful answer to your question because they may be doing something that is illegal or prohibited in some way. And then you really have difficulty getting an honest answer to a question when you start asking athletes if they have been doping in sports. Because an athlete is going to have a huge premium on denying that he, is, he or she has been doping. Because if they get busted, they might lose a $5 million Nike contract. They might be uh, prohibited from competition for two years. So it's very hard to get a straight answer particularly in a situation like this. Now, as you all know, we have lots of ways that we try to, to get honest answers out of people. We uh, can assure them of confidentiality. We give them consent forms that the study has gone through the IRB and that everything they say to us will be kept confidential. But people may still be apprehensive about whether their information might leak out. You could get maybe even a higher level of protection with anonymity. You can give people a, a sheet of paper which has no identifying information on it where they simply check off the answers and stick it into a sealed box somewhere with no identifying information. Uh, but they may still think that there's a trick somewhere and there might be some way that you could detect who they were. Or you could do an internet survey where they click on a URL and they get a click on a link and have a questionnaire that they fill out. But once again, uh, people may think that there may be some trick that you can identify their, their uh, web address or there might be some way. And so you'll still get people who are going to be reluctant to give you a straight answer to your question. But what if there were a way that you could ask questions to somebody with an absolute guarantee that was visible, which visibly guaranteed right to your own eyes that I could not possibly bust you. I could not possibly know the answer to the question um, and that you could safely answer without any fear of, of apprehension. Well, it turns out there is such a technique and it was invented more than 50 years ago. It's called the randomized response technique and was originally proposed by a guy named Warner in a statistical journal back in the 60s. And it was not widely used in, in the early years, but has now been increasingly recognized. And now there, there have been a number of, of variations and refinements on Warner's original technique um, to, to try to, to make it even more statistically stable and even more user friendly. And one of these refinements is the so-called um, unrelated question method. And the method that we used in the study that I'm about to describe to you was this so-called unrelated question method. 
So how does this work? Well, suppose I want to ask you if you've used illicit drugs in the last one year, okay? Well, the way that I do this is I have two alternative questions. One of the questions is a harmless question about some random issue, uh, you know, was your mother born in the first six months of the year or some, some uh, innocuous question. And then the other is the drug use question, is the, is the target question where I'm actually trying to get the information. But then the other ingredient is that there has to be a randomization method so that when you answer yes, I don't know whether you're answering yes to the harmless question A or whether you're answering yes to the target question about drug abuse, question B. And if, if there's no way that I, as the investigator, know which question you're answering, then you can safely answer honestly because I couldn't bust you if I tried. So let me, let me illustrate this in, in concrete terms so that it becomes a little more comprehensible. So I come up to you, and I've got a little tablet computer, and I give you a die. And a die is like one of a pair of dice, okay? And I say, I want you to roll this die. Don't show it to me. And if the number that you get is a one or a two, I want you to answer question A on the next screen of my tablet. On the other hand, if you've got a three, four, or a five in there, I want you to answer question B on the next screen. And remember, you can safely answer, because I have no way of knowing what number you've got in there, um, and only you can see this number, and therefore, you can answer honestly without any fear of getting apprehended. And then comes the next screen. And question A, is the harmless question, where I ask you to think of somebody close to you. You don't even have to tell me who it is. It could be your, your mother, your, your, your spouse, your oldest grandchild, whoever. And the question is, was that person born on an odd number day of the month? And then question B is the sensitive question. Have you used an illicit drug? Well, now, my answer is yes. But you can't tell whether I'm saying yes because my youngest daughter was born on an odd number day, or whether I'm saying yes because I'm a druggie. You, there's no, no way that you can distinguish. You can look over my shoulder, you can know my name, address, my social security number, but you cannot bust me when I answer this question because without seeing the die, you cannot tell whether I'm answering question A or question B. So I can safely an answer honestly. Um, now, it doesn't work, you can't bust me for an individual person, but suppose that I do this for a thousand people. Well, if you do it for a thousand people, then you can get a fairly accurate estimate of the percentage of people who have used illicit drugs in my hypothetical example. So I, I gotta subject you to a little math here just to, to, uh, to understand it. So let's suppose we, we give our test to a thousand people, or a, a thousand high school students, okay? And P is the probability that you're gonna get question A, okay? And in this case, P is one, one out of three. It's, it's, if you get a one or a two with the die, that means you have to answer question A um, about the close person having an odd number birthday. So out of 1,000 people, we're gonna have roughly, roughly 333 of them are gonna get a one or a two on their die, and they're gonna be directed to answer question A. And the other two-thirds of the people, which is one minus P, uh, or roughly 667 people, are gonna, gonna be, are gonna throw a three, four, five, or a six on the die, and they're gonna have to go to question B. Okay, so now, pi sub n is the probability that you're gonna give a yes on question A. And pi sub n is obviously exactly 50-50, because 50%, because half of people have an odd number of birthday. So we know what pi sub n is. However, pi sub s is the variable that we're looking for, which is what is the prevalence of drug use among our 1,000 high school students? And we don't know what pi sub s is, but let's say that pi sub s is 40%. Well, if it's 40%, that means that out of these 667 people who get the drug question, 40% of them 
are going to answer yes, because they have, in fact, used an illicit drug in the last year. And the other 60% of them are going to answer no, because they haven't. Okay? So in this example, the total number of yeses that you're going to get out of all of your 1,000 people is you're going to get these, these people here who said yes, uh, because they got question A and they had an odd number close birthday for their close person, plus these yeses down here. And so lambda, which is the total percentage of yes answers that you get from the entire group, is going to be that group there plus this group here. So it's p times pi sub n plus 1 minus p times pi sub s. And without belaboring the, the math here, if we take the, this equation down at the bottom of the slide and we solve it for pi sub s, we can estimate the prevalence of drug use. So as long as I know the probability of, of a yes answer on question A and I know the probability of you're getting a 1 or a 2 on a die, I can mathematically compute, use those to compute the prevalence of drug use out of 1,000 people. And again, without belaboring you on the math, I can estimate the variance of, uh, I can give you the, the variance of my estimate, which allows me to calculate the margin of error um, in my estimate. So let me just give you a, a concrete example with real numbers. So we go to uh, a local high school, and we go to 1,200 kids, and we do this same study with the die, just as I did. So P is 1 out of 3. Pi sub n, which is the probability that you've got a relative with an odd number birthday, is 0 0.5. And let's say that we get, 1200, we get 530 yeses out of our 1,200 people. Well, we just, uh, 530 out of 1,200 means that our estimated lambda is 0.442. So we just plug those numbers into this formula that I just showed you, and lo and behold, we find that an estimated 41.3% of our 1,200 high school students have used an illicit drug. And then we can calculate the variance down here, and from that we can calculate the 95% confidence interval. So what we find in our hypothetical case is that about 41.3, we're estimating 41.3% of our high school students have used drugs, and we got a margin of error of around 5% on either side of that. And that's how the technique works. But now, it's very important to have a large sample size, because if the sample size is smaller, then your margin of error gets huge. So if we were to only look at 300 students, then our margin of error is about 10% on either side. And so if we, were, but if we were to look at 50 students, then as you can see, the margin of error is, is huge. It's like 20% on either side of 41. So I can give you a pretty precise estimate of how many high school students have used drugs, but I cannot tell you how many people in Mrs. Connor's home room have used drugs because there's not enough of them for me to be able to, to make an accurate estimate. So this technique only works if you can get big samples of people. Um, so now before I go on, let me just add one more little twist to this, uh, just to simplify things. In real life, if you're going around trying to do this, it's pretty cumbersome to go around with a cup and a die and keep giving it to 1,200 different people. And so you can make it a little easier for them by having a question that randomizes them right from the start. And so what you do in, in that case is you say, we start to say, think of somebody close to you, such as a family member or friend, whose birth date you know, same, same idea. And if that person was born in the first four months of the year, between January 1st and April 30th, then you go to the question A, the harmless question. If that person was born in the last eight months of the year, from May 1st to December 31st, then you gotta go to question B, which as you know is the drug use question. And uh, then question A, once again, is, is a harmless question. It asks you to think of that same person that you've got in your mind and were they born on an odd number day. So we know that the probability of a yes on question A is 50-50. And then question B, which is our target question, is the one where we're looking to find out the percentage of people who answer yes using the math that I just showed to you. And when I give you this, I, I reassure you while you're standing in front of me, you say, remember, 
You, if, if you answer yes, it's totally safe. I cannot tell you know, whether you're answering yes to question A or whether you're answering yes to question B because I have no idea what close person you're thinking of, you know, whether it's your mother or your grandchild or whatever, uh, much less what the birth date of that person is. So there's no way I could possibly tell whether you're giving me a yes on A or giving me a yes on B. So please, an answer honestly, it's totally safe. You cannot possibly uh, get busted in doing this. So that's how the technique works. In 2011, I got an email from the World Anti-Doping Administration in Montreal. And WADA, as they are known, is entrusted with doing testing in all of the big athletic events. Uh, spends $300 million a year doing blood and urine testing for athletes who are doping. And they invited uh, 10 of us, a, a world-class group. There were three Americans, a Japanese, a Hungarian, a British, three Germans, a Canadian, and French, uh, members of our, our group. And they said, you know, the number of people who get busted with urine testing is 1%, 2%, maybe 3%. But we believe that the true rate of doping is probably a good deal bet higher than that because the athletes have found all kinds of clever ways to cheat or clever ways to beat the tests. And we'd really like to try to get an estimate of what the real rate of doping is out there. And so what we proposed to do, as you would guess, was to do a randomized response technique. And so we, we devised a randomized response instrument very similar to what I just showed you. And I'll, I'll show it the actual one shortly. And we took it to Daegu, Korea, to the World's Championships in athletics uh, back in 2011 in Korea. And Léa Cléré, who was the, the French member of our team, um, assembled a dream team of case finders to go around and actually just, oh, excuse me, this is, this is the countries that competed in Daegu. Uh, the only ones that did not compete that are in gray is North Korea, South Sudan, and Jordan. Virtually every other country in the world competed. So this, this was, you know, the top, the, the leading countries of the world, you know, the top athletes in the world with about 1,800 people competing in a variety of events. So returning to my narrative, Leia got together a dream team of case finders. Uh, and this is a photograph I took in, in, uh, in Daegu when we were there. On the left is uh, Li Chu Wei, who is a native speaker of Mandarin, uh, also spoke English. Uh, Dmitry Vorobayov, native speaker of Russian, also spoke fluent German and pretty good Italian, Spanish, and English. Uh, Ricky James uh, spoke English and uh, Creole. Uh, Fatma Lanouar, from, uh, she was from Tunisia, uh, spoke native speaker of Arabic, spoke French. Fatma actually was a, a world-class athlete in her own right. Uh, when, uh, in, when she was in her 20s, she did the 1500 meter in 406. Uh, uh, Li Chi Wu, who uh, was our local Korean uh, from, from the Daegu area. Um, and then what was the name of our, um, she was Spanish. Her name escapes me, um, oh, I'm embarrassed. But at any rate, she was a native speaker of Spanish uh, and also English. And then finally on the far right is Leah herself. Uh, Leah speaks both English and French, both without an accent, because she spent half of her life growing up on one side of the channel and then half the year on the other side of the channel. So this group of people, you know, collectively speaking 10 or 12 languages, went around the, the games in Daegu with tablet computers and hunted down all of the athletes to give them this questionnaire using the randomized response technique. And they, you know, hung out across through the athlete's village and especially in the cafeteria. And they would, they would uh, stand at the cafeteria and get these people as they came through. And when you, when you had done the questionnaire, you got a little, a little token prize from WADA for doing it. And then you got a little pin to wear to ensure that we didn't approach you five times over, you know, that, that we knew that you'd already done the questionnaire. And we, we did very well. There were 1,290 of the athletes who were approached by um, the six case finders. And 93% of them agreed to do it. Only 7% declined 
to um, actually take the test after seeing the introductory screen. And the questions were presented in 28 languages, which had been translated and back translated by UN certified translators. So when you were given consent to proceed with the study, you were, you were in the great majority of cases, you were doing it in your native language, or at the very least in a language that you spoke well. Um, so once you'd agreed that you'd be willing to do the test, the, te the screens that you saw on the tablet are very similar to the example that I had showed you earlier for the randomized response technique. So it begins by assuring you that this is very brief and that no one will ever know that you answered other than you. And obviously this screen would be in, I'm showing you the English version, but if you wanted to take it in Urdu, you could do it in Urdu. If you want to do it in Greek, you could do it in Greek, uh, et cetera. So then we, we use the same technique of thinking of somebody close to you, a uh, parent, sibling, friend, or even yourself, whose date of birth you know. Um, and we then go to a, a, a randomization question very similar to the randomization question that I showed you earlier. So if that person close to you was born between the first and the tenth day of a month, you were asked to go to question A on the next screen and answer it honestly. If the person close to you was born between the eleventh and the thirty-first day of the month, then you had to go to question B and answer it honestly. And you can guess uh, the question. So question A was simply that person close to you, were they born in the first half of the year between January and June? And then question B, the target question, have you knowingly violated anti-doping regulations by using a prohibited substance or method in the past 12 months? And uh, remember that you're going to have somebody standing in front of you who probably speaks your language to reassure you uh, again and again that there's no way that we could bust you on this question, that you can safely answer because we have no possible way of knowing whether you're answering question A or question B. And I think because of the fact that our case finders were, were such polyglots, you know, with so many different languages they spoke, uh, we, we were able to get this very, very high compliance rate from, from our athletes in, in Korea. Uh, and when the results came in, um, uh, there were about 440 people who were medal medalists who medaled um, at the uh, uh, World Championships in Daegu. And of those 440 people, two of them got busted on urine testing for doping. So the, the um, basis of biological testing there was a 0.5% uh, rate of doping. When we did the math for the randomized response technique on the 1,200 athletes that we did, the rate was 43.6%. <laughs> you can imagine that those results were pretty stunning. We reassembled in Montreal and took a look at these results and said, well, I guess the first thing we need to do is to see if we can replicate this somewhere else, uh, see if it happens, if we can do it again. So what we did is we took the same questionnaire to Doha in Qatar on the Persian Gulf and did the, the identical study at the Pan-Arab Games that were being held down there uh, just in the outskirts of Doha. Uh, the Pan-Arab Games uh, are for all of the Arab-speaking Arab countries uh, from North Africa and uh, the Middle East. And at the Pan-Arab Games, we approached 1,030 athletes. This time, the questionnaire was available only in Arabic, French, and English, because almost everybody spoke Arabic. And so there was no need to have the 28 languages. So we just did Arabic, French, and English. And we had a bunch of case finders who spoke Arabic to, to help us. And once again, we got 93% of, of the athletes agreed to do the, to do the st study. Um, and, um, and I've already mentioned the, the choice of languages. So at the Pan-Arab Games, a somewhat larger portion of the athletes got busted on the basis of urine and drug testing, with 3.6% of the people who reached the medal level uh, being found to have uh, had doping on the basis of testing. 
And on the basis of the randomized response technique, the result was 57%, well over half of the, of the athletes. Yeah, this isn't just one hit on a joint hit part. Right? <laughs> this is doping for athletic enhancement. You, yeah, you are anticipating a slide that will appear near the end of the talk. Uh, a, a critical question, a critical question, which I will address. Yes. Also, Skip, you said, at least on the last test, you said in the first number of depth that it was medalists, not the entire sample. Yeah, because if you if you don't if you're not in the top group, they don't waste the money studying your urine sample because you don't have a chance of getting a medal. So they only test the people at the top end. So that's not exactly what's happening in this smaller company. That's right. That that it's conceivable that the people who did not reach the medal level might have had a somewhat higher or somewhat lower prevalence of dope. Correct. Correct. Is that the case for this also that that three point six is of medalists? Those are medalists also. Right. Okay. So it's a little higher. It's not. 52, but it's higher than, it's probably higher than that. That, that. That what is higher than what? That the proportion of competitors in the event, oh, that, that the proportion of competitors in the event were doping. Yeah, um, yeah. There's no way to know. The, the people who did not reach the medal level might have had possibly a slightly lower prevalence of doping. But, yep. you know, witness the fact that they yep. didn't reach the medal level. Yep. Or, you know, uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, so we don't know. Yep. So at any rate, um, we um, came out with these results. And you can imagine that the various uh, sports bodies went ballistic uh, about finding when they found out what we had found. And there was huge hassling back and forth between the IAAF and WADA and all kinds of stuff. And I won't bore you with it. But um, it eventually got to the level that the um, issue of doping in international sports got all the way up to having hearings in the British Parliament. And they even got Lord Sebastian Coe, who was the head of the, the new head of the IAAF, himself the former holder of the world record in the mile uh, as a young man, got even Sebastian Coe on the stand. And then the Parliament somehow got a pirated draft copy of my paper and posted it on the internet. You know, I've written like 300 papers, but I, I've never had anybody who got a, like a pirated copy of my paper and put it on the internet before I had it published. And you know, could could well have been. But, but you know, what was I going to do? Sue the Parliament of the United Kingdom? Uh, and so at any rate, uh, uh, to make a very long story short, we finally had the paper published. It came out this summer. And as you can imagine, um, when, it, when it got published, it you know, created a huge surge of, of news uh, all around the world. Uh, Rolf Ulrich, who was my collaborator, who, who was the, the mathematician guy who did all that stuff, you know, ended up on television all over the place and, and uh, uh, various uh, outlets you know, around, around the world started showing these results. Um, some of us who had been in the business for a long time were not particularly shocked that the level of doping was so much higher than was sort of popularly believed. But a lot of people, I think, actually thought that these 1 or 2% rates were actually valid and failed to realize that there's all kinds of ways that these athletes can cheat. There is a constant arms race, so to speak, between the athletes and the testers. And the athletes are always one jump ahead of the testers with all of these new compounds, selective androgen receptor modulators, gene doping, myostatin inhibitors, the list, the list goes on. Uh, so, um, but at any rate, it's clear that a very, very large percentage of these, of these international athletes are finding ways to get around the tests. Well, now, now we come to your question and various other questions. Um, are we sure that these results are really true? Is, is this believable? Well, sort of the first most obvious methodological limitations that, that might spring to mind is um, noncompliance by the athletes. Well, I mean, as you saw, about 7% of the athletes at both of the two events refused to take the test in the first place. But if you refuse to take the test, the chances are more likely that you're a doper than a non-doper. Because if you're a non-doper and you have nothing to hide, there'd be no particular reason that you'd refuse to do the test. So if anything, the 7% who did not take the test 
probably had a somewhat higher prevalence of dopers than the 93% who did take the test, which means that we would have underestimated rather than overestimated the true prevalence of doping at the events. And then what about the possibility of if you're a doper and you choose somebody close to you and you flip to the next screen and you discover that you're being asked to answer question B, the doping question, well, even despite all of our assurances of confidentiality, you might just instinctively, as a self-protective measure, you might just say no, just for safety. But in that case, that again would have caused us to underestimate the true prevalence of doping. So that both of these types of non-compliance would, 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 have, would have caused us to underestimate the prevalence, it would mean that it was even higher than the figures that we quoted. Now, um, the, the, this now goes to your, next slide goes to your question, and that is, um, oh, actually, the next slide after this. Um, we did notice that among the athletes, we, we, we timed how long it took them to do the test. And there were some who did the test very fast, you know, went through all of the four screens in 15 seconds. And among the very fast responders, the rates of doping were even higher than they were among the slower responders. Um, and we're not sure why that might have been, but we considered just in an, abundant, in an abundance of conservatism, we considered, well, maybe these, these very fast responders who have an even higher prevalence of doping, maybe there's some glitch that is causing false answers. And so we tried deliberately subtracting out the fastest responders, but we found that no matter how you sliced it or diced it, no matter uh, what, what percentage of fast responders you deleted, that no matter, that under no scenario could you make the prevalence come out to less than 30% at the World Champions in Korea or less than 45% at the Pan Arab Games. Um, and then finally, turning to Rob Aronow's question, um, what about the possibility that an athlete smoked a little weed six months before competing in the games, and, um, and which, is, which is legal? It, it, is, it is not prohibited to use marijuana. It, it's prohibited to have marijuana in your system during competition, but it is not prohibited to use marijuana recreationally way out of competition. But let's say that an athlete erroneously thought that that was technically prohibited and answered yes. Well, then that would be a false positive. But then there are other athletes who would be erroneous false negatives and would say, oh, well, I was prescribed such and such by my doctor, failing to realize that in fact the substance was prohibited and they had no exemption to be able to use that substance. So you could get both false positives and false negatives, but it's unlikely that those would be terribly frequent. These are world-class athletes. These are people who know their stuff, who've been competing at the top level. They're gonna know the rules pretty damn well uh, and, and are unlikely to have, make mistakes as to what was or was not prohibited. And furthermore, even if you allow for such mistakes, there's gonna be some false positives being canceled out by some false negatives. So we doubt that that would have a significant effect. Um, the published paper uh, comes with a supplement uh, that we created mostly by Rolf Ulrich that has like 30 pages of math going, going through all possible scenarios of compliance or non-compliance. And the, sh the short answer is that, that almost under any scenario, um, the, the, the estimate remains surprisingly stable and, and would not deviate very far from the, and, and, and if anything, is too low uh, uh, in, in terms of the estimates that we did. And just to give you one other sort of source of reassurance on this, when we went to, to Qatar and we did the, the uh, test at the Pan Arab Games, we threw in another question about use of, of permitted supplements. So we asked you, have you used any supplements in the course of competition? So there's a question you can answer it perfectly safely because there nothing, there's nothing banned about the use of supplements. So you could, you could safely answer yes because it's not, not gonna have any effect on you. And when we asked that question about use of supplements, that about 70% of the athletes in, in uh, Doha, in, in Qatar, said that yes, they had used supplements within the past year. And we then looked at a meta-analysis of recent studies uh, of supplement use in international sports, which looked at well, more than a half a dozen studies of supplement use, 
And by golly, those studies came in right on, right the same as we got. So once again, this suggests that the randomized response technique is producing pretty realistic figures. And, and until proved otherwise, these estimates are, are probably reasonably correct. So what is the take home message? Well, there's good news. Um, the, the randomized response technique is obviously a very powerful, uh, a very ingenious and powerful technique for getting truthful answers to sensitive questions. The, the types of questions where you and I would, would love to know the answer, but where it's very tough to actually be sure that you're getting a straight answer out of the people that you're studying. And um, just to give you just a, a couple of random examples, you know, how many college students are taking their roommates Vivance, you know, or their friends Adderall to study. You know, how, how widely does that occur? I bet it happens pretty widely. I, I think most of us suspect that things like that happen pretty widely. But, you know, there's no way that you'd get, you'd be able to get a straight answer if you just went out and just asked college students to their face about this. But if you did this with the randomized response technique, that's precisely the type of question that the RRT would be very effective for, for getting, getting an answer. You know, as long as you had a big sample size, as I described, you know, I need a thousand people to do it. Um, what about scientists? Um, how many scientists have, you know, faked data, cheated on their data analysis, fudged their data in something that they published? Well, if you went and asked a thousand scientists to their face, virtually everyone would undoubtedly deny that they had ever done such a thing. But my hunch is it's probably more common than we'd like to think, and you're not gonna get a straight answer. Even, even if you promised anonymity, you probably still would not get a straight answer. But with the RRT, that, that's something where you, you probably could get an actual answer to that question uh, and get a, a reasonably valid estimate. And then, of course, another sort of obvious, an obvious place for the RRT is politics. You know, that people in politics will, uh, may, may privately harbor a belief, but may not be willing to publicly tell you, you know, what, what they believe. And so with the RRT, you may very well be able to extract truthful information on delicate or sensitive questions where you couldn't get a straight answer, even if you assured people of confidentiality, uh, because they would be too apprehensive uh, about, about their, their, their truth being known. So the RRT is a, a very powerful technique, one that I, 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 I've you know, become a real believer you know, after having been through all of this and having seen the, uh, the results of the study. Um, and I would hope to see that it, that it becomes used more widely. Uh, Ulrich and I are now actually working on another statistical paper to make it even more powerful, I won't bore you with the details, but if you use, if you have a thousand people and you use the RRT with two different probabilities in, in two subsets of 500 people, you can actually create upper and lower bounds and, and, and make even more clever estimates with it. But suffice it to say that, it, that it's a very ingenious technique. Of course, the bad news is that doping is a huge issue in international sports. And I, I think that most people in the lay population um, are, are believe that you know, doping is just a, you know, a small fraction of people uh, that uh, uh, you know, get busted with, with testing and that people probably have very little idea of the sheer magnitude of surreptitious doping and cheating that occurs. And as I said earlier, there's a constant of arms race here between the athletes and the testers, especially at the international level. Uh, and there are people doing micro doping in various places and uh, surreptitious doping of various types at, at times when they're, they're, they're away from the possibility of getting tested. Novel compounds that I mentioned, gene doping, myostatin inhibitors, selective androgen receptor mod modulators, and numerous other things uh, that are constantly evolving. And at WADA, they're, they're doing a, you know, a hard job of, of trying to keep up with this and developing new and more clever tests, but um, it's, it's a constant battle and the athletes continue to be running ahead of the testers. And I think that the sort of the bottom line is we have to get used to that. Uh, there, it's not obvious that this scenario is going to change in the, at any time in the immediate future, uh, and that uh, this is an issue that 
is going to be around for a long time. Thank you. That's a great talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, I, uh, a comment and a question. The comment is, uh, back in the 80s, I was involved with HIV testing. And uh, we asked uh, students at, um, Oh, I forget the uh, Holy Cross. Uh, have you when was the last? Have you used a needle in the past 30 days? And we got like a 35 percent response rate. Yes, and we were saying, "Whoa, what's that all about?" Turns out, of course, it was you know high athlete population, and 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 they were using uh, steroids. Um, so just uh, I just like say, you know, one of the reasons we give for not allowing doping is that it's not fair. Well, it's not fair. Uh, third or 40 percent are doing it. Uh, we also say, well, it's bad for people. We have this, you know, we're going to protect you. We're going to take away your autonomy, uh, and we're going to protect you. So just a thought question is, what if we said, you can do anything you want. It's open to everybody all the time. I'd like your thoughts on that. Um, that was the first question that was asked of me when I gave this identical talk uh, at Tufts uh, last, last month. And it's, it's a, a, a tough question. No, uh, should we just say throw open the doors and say, you know, this this is there's no point in trying to go through this sham of pretending that we can eliminate all of these people. Let's just give up. And of course, it's it's a serious problem, and it is compounded, um, as you hinted in your question, by culture, that we assume that that everybody would agree with our Western cultural notion that there should be a completely level playing field and that everybody should play fair, but. You may be an athlete who comes from a culture that doesn't have Western cultural notions. You may feel that, that, that you, you are obliged to take anabolic steroids or some doping substance for your country. Even if you feel it's dangerous to yourself, you may feel that you, you really ought to do it. Uh, so that there, there are, there's the, the medical you know, safety issue, there's the philosophical issue of what can you tell people to do or not do. Uh, there's a cultural issue, so it becomes a very complex question. And they don't with, want to help me. Right, a very complex question with no with no obvious right answer. What's your opinion? My my opinion is is basically a passive opinion that I I, I well, as a scientist, it's hard for me to give an opinion as a scientist because the the scientific aspect of this is such a small portion of the total argument and the, the political and cultural aspects are so great that I'm really not even qualified to give an opinion. Uh, yes? If, 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 you can, if you can take the microphone once, it's on. Okay, Skip, I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you. Not being a scientist, I just have a question about the randomization of the people for the study. For example, uh, you would pick, pick somebody you know, and if their birthday is like January through April, then you go to A, so it's the first four months, but then you go to eight months, and I'm curious why it wasn't six months and six months, and the same for the second example that you gave, the birthday um, on a month, one through 10, then you pick, uh, uh, question A, or if it's 10, 11 through 30, one, you pick B. And I'm, again, I was just curious why it wasn't one through 15, maybe, and 16 through 31. If you could just explain that, that would be great. A, a good question. And th there's a, a specific reason for that, and that is that you want to have, you, the, the question you're interested in, obviously, is question B about doping. And if you get a larger number of, if, only, if you're only asking the doping question out of half of the people that you're seeing, you're not going to have as much statistical power as if you're asking that question out of two-thirds of the people that you're seeing. And so you want to stack the deck a little bit in favor of the doping question. But you don't want to stack it too much. You don't want to have it like that 90% like of the people are getting the doping question, because then I might get paranoid and think, well, you know, I'm, I'm not very well protected here. So if I say a yes, they'll know 9 out of 10 that I'm answering the doping question. So that, that's a... The reason. Right. Yeah. Skip, fantastic talk. Thanks. Uh, I can foresee applications of this technique in other domains of medicine. For example, public health, studying infectious diseases, interventions, let's say, to stop HIV transmission. Is it, are people looking at this technique in other domains aside from the sports and doping issue? I'm not aware of that in, in public health domains, although you're absolutely correct. It's an obvious, an obvious application to the randomized response technique. You know, have, have you engaged in risk factors you know, for HIV? You know, 
know, if you ask me, you know, have I shared navels? Uh, have I shared needles? Have I uh, been subjected to receptive anal intercourse? Have, you know, whatever. You're you're very likely not to get a straight answer out of people for questions like that. And the RRT would give you would give you a much more precise estimate. Yeah. Let's skip back here. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. So a comment and a question. Um, so my comment is with regards to the rate of responding or the faster responders, we know that individuals who are impulsive tend to respond faster on all sorts of tasks. And individuals who are impulsive also are more likely to engage in drug use. So I wonder if perhaps that accounts for part of that, um, the higher rate of um, illicit substance use in that group. Um, so that's just one thought. And then um, my question is, I can't quite recall the text of the question you asked. Did it ask, um, at this particular meet, did you engage in doping? Uh, we asked, within the past 12 months, okay. in the 12 months prior to this moment, have you okay. engaged in a prohibited doping substance or method? Because then uh, the, um, the actual tests are then sort of point prevalence, so to speak, the actual testing they do. Um, and then one of the other is 12-month pre prevalence, which so you might expect slightly different, although probably not right. 40 so that, percent. That, as, as you appropriately point out, that accounts for part of the spread right. between the very low uh, point prevalence estimate and, and the uh, self-response estimate. Absolutely. Yes. I think you skip. Um, you and I are old enough to remember when we knew governments actively uh, coerced and actually chose young athletes in the Soviet Union and East Germany from the ages of 12 and and put them through very powerful drug treatments, which led to the infertility of a lot of the female athletes that won a lot of medals back then. But trying to imagine that 40% of these people who've come from, are not innately wealthy somehow secretly find access to treatments. First question is that are questionably effective since no one's testing them in a good lab. And also it costs money. And they're finding that information in some dark website and how that could all happen. Well, the, the, the web has, has been a huge source of, of all of that information. There are entire websites about these novel compounds, some of which you can buy legally right here in the United States because they're so new that nobody's had a chance to make them illegal yet much less figure out what dangers they might have. And with regard to money, I mean, yes, we remember when governments actually did this, but the governments are still doing it right now. And uh, governments have money that is, that is sometimes invested in, in such things. Uh, so that, and also, world-class athletes often do have money to, uh, to invest in doping. So, and, and finally, some of these techniques are not necessarily that expensive, as long as you're clever enough to use them so that you won't get detected. Thank you. Just to uh, have a quick question in terms of the uh, some news coming that in China they're already doing genetic modifications of the athletes and soldiers. So how close are we to genetic <laughs> people being genetically modified for <laughs> athletics and uh, other performance? Right. We're, we're there already. Uh, that, that, that is a, a realistic technology even, even as we speak. And WADA is already wrestling with how to potentially detect that. That, that that's, that's an issue that's, that is actually actively being discussed. Behind you. Skip, just out of curiosity, as in a Chem 7 or a Chem 21 as clinicians, do you have any idea how many data points they test? In, do they do blood and urine or just urine? Um, I think generally it is just urine. And how? Again, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not familiar enough with the actual technicalities mm -hmm. of the testing that they do to be able to answer that. I was just curious if it was 98 different chemicals they looked for, 150 or 20 or... The prohibited list is, goes into the hundreds of substances, about two or three hundred, I believe. Right? And that's just prohibited substances, because our, our study also looks at prohibited methods as well. So we've got another one. It seems like every time you've done this questionnaire, you've had a lot of reassurance that there is no way that you will know their answer to whichever question they're answering. So do you ever see that this could be scaled up so that you don't need to have someone personally there administering the test um, in a case where you could do it online or something like that? 
I, I think you could, you could certainly do that online. And the advantage of doing something online, of course, is that you get very large sample sizes, which would, which would reduce your margin of error substantially. But the problem with online is the, the risk of selection bias, which is the people who choose to, to take your test may not be representative of the entire source population from which they are drawn. Uh, in other words, if I'm a doper and you give me, and, and I stumble upon an invitation to do a survey about doping, um, despite the assurances of the randomized response technique, I might just say, I think I won't, I think I'll pass on this one, I, I won't do it. So that you, you, never, you don't know for sure whether, you, whether you're getting a, a, a random sample. And to, to here, we were able to get a random sample simply because we spent a lot of money to get all these people and fly them all over to Korea and actually go up to all the athletes you know, in the entire event. So that it was, it was expensive, but it reduces, greatly reduces the probability of selection bias that you get when doing an online type of survey. I'm intrigued by the cultural questions. And um, it's easy to imagine that it would be damaging to the sport's image um, you know, to, to reveal that our heroes are actually dirty. So of course the commissioners are going to oppose that. At the same time, if you're an athlete who's been clean and you learn that around half your competitors are all doping, um, I could see being upset that you're at a, putting yourself at a disadvantage and that it, results like this might influence more athletes who want to use. Yeah, that's, that's certainly plausible. Yeah. Well, to, to even build on that, I'm actually thinking that it's a selection bias that like if you're looking to be a weightlifter and anabolic steroids are allowed, no, people who don't use anabolic steroids aren't going to make it into the weightlifting competition. They just aren't. It's going to be humanly impossible no matter how hard they work. And I think for a lot of other sports, the same applies, that if you're not doping, you're not going to make it. It doesn't matter how much natural talent you were born with. It doesn't matter how hard you've worked. It doesn't matter how much money your parents and trainers are putting into you. It's not going to be able to compete with effective doping. And so it, so I, I think just in professional sports right now, the way the system is that we, we have a lot of dopers, if not almost all dopers. I've got to tell you an anecdote in response to, to that. Um, some years ago, I think you were in the audience, Jim, at the time, um, I gave a talk at the uh, California Society of Addiction Medicine. It was one of these big things with like 800 people in some hotel ballroom. And I gave a talk about uh, steroids. And then the guy next to me, was Don Catlin, who is uh, probably the premier biological tester in the world. His laboratory did all the testing. He developed it for the LA Olympics in 84, and since that time has been the, one of the premier labs testing for performance-enhancing drugs. And after the talk, the audience threw a couple of perfunctory questions at me, and then they all homed in on Catlin. And after the first couple of questions, the question of all of the sort of said, well, Dr. Catlin, do you think that so-and-so might be using drugs, or do you think so-and-so is using drugs? And Catlin ducked the first couple of questions, and then realizing that it was hopeless, he stepped back from the microphone and said, somewhere in the vast pack of cyclists coming through the Arc de Triomphe at the end of the Tour de France, somewhere way back in that pack is the greatest cyclist in the world. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when... You know, I know that I uh, lie through my teeth when I, uh, in order to get to have a, uh, an effect when I get asked uh, by a, a political question on the phone, election time, and I know that everyone in this room does too. They all lie because they want to distort the outcome. Uh, and so the question might be, one of the one of the methodological questions might be is, do, are, are people actually falsely responding that they use because they ha, they want to they they want to give the idea that there's a lot of use out there. The non-users are paranoid about co co-users, and they want uh, the outcome to show that there's a lot of use out there and pull out your microscopes. Um. That certainly, it's certainly plausible that that happens with an occasional person. Um, and I believe that we even consider that in our supplement to the, to the paper, where we go through all the various statistical exercises of different forms of compliance. But you'd have to postulate a, a very high, a, a fairly high rate of that to, to, alter, the, to alter the RRT estimate significantly. Um, uh, 
Uh, Skip, um, well, you were asked a question about uh, competing in certain sports and whether you needed to use drugs to compete at them. I think I remember Don Catlin estimating the prevalence of steroid use among NFL linemen to be between 99 and 101 percent, um, <laughs> or something to that effect, maybe off the record. Uh, but you've done a lot of work with in the in the gym subculture with anabolic steroids. You know, just to put that in perspective, in weightlifting, you've done a lot of work with competition athletes there. Uh, what would you say about the necessity or lack thereof of, of, of these drugs in that sport? Well, in, in competition bodybuilding, um, the, the, the rate is between 99 and 102 percent, probably towards the upper end of that range. Um, and um, there are so-called natural bodybuilding contests, but that's as easy that when people cheat on natural bodybuilding contests all the time, and there are entire vast web pages about how to cheat on natural bodybuilding contests, uh, so so that uh, uh, one can't help but be fairly cynical about that. And and the the reason is, as as Chris Palmer pointed out, is that these drugs work. They, these techniques do work. They work extremely well, and they allow people to achieve levels of performance that cannot be achieved by any natural human being, no no matter how gifted and how dedicated, and that's, it's just a fact of biology that we have to live with. All right, with that, it's one o'clock. Let's have a round of applause for Dr. Pope. Thank you very much.